This screencast is intended for teachers of fourth grade social studies to aid in the teaching of the Georgia Standards of Excellence. The issue of slavery had been a growing bone of contention in our country since its inception, but a number of things brought the issue to a head in the mid-1800s. Our standard asks us specifically to examine how the publishing of Uncle Tom's Cabin, as a part of the growing anti-slavery movement, influenced many to realize just how cruel slavery was, and how John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry widened the already growing schism between South and North. In addition to slavery as the root cause of the Civil War, we will look at how many in the South felt the issue was also a question of states' rights, and how they believed the North and federal government were infringing upon theirs. Next, we will examine how the election of Abraham Lincoln was the catalyst that lit the spark of war, resulting in the first battle at Fort Sumter, the election of Jefferson Davis as President for the Confederate States of America, the military genius of Lee and Grant in commanding their troops through the turning point of Gettysburg, and how Sherman's strategy of total war resulted in the Atlanta Campaign and Sherman's march to the sea, leading to the eventual defeat and surrender of the South at Appomattox Courthouse. The divide in our country over slavery was not something new that suddenly sprang up in the early to mid-1800s. It had been there since Thomas Jefferson asserted that all men were created equal in the Declaration of Independence. It became a bone of contention in the writing of the Constitution when it came time to determine the distribution of power in the legislative branches of our new government and was, at least temporarily, settled with the Three-Fifths Compromise. It once again reared its ugly head during westward expansion every time a new territory came into our control, and nearly reached a flashpoint when Missouri requested admittance into the Union as a slave state. As with the Three-Fifths Compromise, however, much of the question lay in the balance of power in Congress between slave and free states, and the boundaries of control between state and federal government more so than over the issue of slavery itself. At further issue was the question over whether the federal government, specifically Congress, had the power to decide whether a state could have slavery or not, and proponents of states' rights believed that new states should have the same right to choose for themselves whether they would allow slavery or not, as the original thirteen colonies did. Once again the dispute was settled with a compromise. The Missouri Compromise, as it became known, ensured that the balance of power between southern slave and northern free states would be maintained by allowing Missouri to enter as a slave state, but admitting Maine as a free state, thereby keeping the number of slave and free states even. Going further, it created an imaginary line across Louisiana that demarked the border between slave and free territories. All territories above the line would be free, and those below slave. Neither side was really happy with the decision, but it kept the peace and allowed us to continue to expand our territory. The debate over all of this resulted in the creation of many anti-slavery groups who quickly came to realize that in order to move the argument from one of control in Congress to the very real atrocities of slavery, they needed to give the problem a human face as it were, and so they took to writing. One such publication that did this very well was Uncle Tom's Cabin, written by the daughter of a Connecticut preacher by the name of Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uncle Tom's Cabin told the story of the life of a slave through its main character, Uncle Tom, and his family. The heart-wrenching tale became a bestseller and brought the true horrors of slavery into the homes of many who had never really seen it before and made this human tragedy impossible to ignore. Into this growing storm steps a fanatical preacher and abolitionist by the name of John Brown, who believed in a violent opposition to slavery, and to that end came up with a plan to attack and take control of a federal armory in Harpers Ferry, Virginia. He, his sons, and his group of followers would then distribute the guns to nearby slaves who would use them in an uprising, sparking rebellion throughout the South. The plan was ill-conceived from the start, and many poor and costly decisions were made during its execution, resulting in the capture and execution of most of the group, including Brown. But the event and the debate that followed served to further heighten tensions between the North and South. While Northerners decried his violent actions at first, his impassioned defense during his trial led many to sympathize with his cause, and soon made him a martyr. Southerners, on the other hand, felt this only proved that Northerners would stop at nothing, even criminal acts and condoning outright murder, in order to exert their will, laws, and beliefs on the South. They also began to fear that others would take Brown's example and try to start a slave rebellion, but with greater success. 
Just as the debate over slavery can trace its roots back to the Constitution, so can the debate over states' rights. The Bill of Rights was added to the Constitution specifically because many states would not ratify it without such a bill for the express purpose of protecting the individual states from an overly powerful federal government. To them, slavery and all of the issues that surrounded it were just another example of the federal government imposing its will on something that the states should have a right to determine for themselves. And it was this very belief that led the first southern states to secede from the Union. But we get ahead of ourselves. The South also saw the whole thing as an attack by an industrialized North on their agricultural way of life that they believed they needed slavery to support. All of this growing outrage over slavery resulted in a lawyer from Illinois being nominated to run for President of the United States on the Republican ticket. That lawyer was an abolitionist by the name of Abraham Lincoln, and many are surprised to find out that he did not wish to end slavery in the South, where it was already established, or end the fugitive slave laws as he supported the Constitution above all else and felt those were protected by it. But he did make it very clear that if elected president, he would bar any new territory from entering into statehood as a slave state, as the Constitution did not prevent that, and he believed it was our moral duty to prevent the spread of slavery further. Southern states believed that the Constitution did in fact protect their right to choose to hold slaves, and that if the new president opposed that, then they in turn had the right to leave or secede from that government and form their own. And that is exactly what they did upon Lincoln's election as president. South Carolina was the first to sever all ties with the United States of America, and six other southern states quickly followed. Representatives from these states met in Montgomery, Alabama to form a new nation called the Confederate States of America and a new government with a new president, President Jefferson Davis. Now before secession, federal forts like Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina were held and maintained by federal soldiers. Upon secession, however, and the formation of the Confederate States of America, these forts and their federal soldiers employed by the United States of America swiftly found themselves in enemy territory. The new Confederacy demanded the surrender and forfeiture of all such forts, but the commander of Fort Sumter refused, remaining loyal to his country. Soon after the representatives from the newly formed Confederate Army delivered their ultimatum, the Confederate forces began bombardment of Fort Sumter. After withstanding 34 hours of bombardment, and having already been short on supplies at the onset of the conflict, and now finding themselves without the powder with which to load their weapons, Commander Anderson surrendered Fort Sumter to the Confederacy, ending any chance for a peaceful solution to the division, along with the first armed conflict of the Civil War. Lincoln firmly believed that secession was unconstitutional, and determined to get Fort Sumter and other forts like it back, and so he issued a call for states to send troops into the South to recapture these forts and return the southern states to the Union. It was this action that would clearly constitute the use of armed force by the federal government to get the southern states to comply that caused an additional four states to secede from the Union. It would be four long years of war before Fort Sumter would once again fly the stars and stripes of the United States of America. Its loss would also prove to be a strategic thorn in the Union Navy's attempted blockade of the South during the war. As the war progressed, two stunning military strategists and leaders rose to take command of their respective armies. For the South, it was General Robert E. Lee, who was originally approached by Abraham Lincoln's representative to lead the Union Army. But Lee was a Virginian, and despite his divided conscience, felt he could not fight against his native Virginia and was assigned to lead the Northern Virginia Regiment for the Confederate Army. After many decisive victories under Lee's leadership, the Northern Virginia Regiment had pushed its way into Pennsylvania, intent on confronting Union troops near the town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. With reinforcements to the Union ranks and their steadfast commitment to holding the Union line, the Union Army was able to repulse Lee's attack, but with considerable loss of life on both sides. The devastating loss to his army forced Lee to retreat back behind southern lines. Gettysburg would prove to be a turning point in the war, and would mark the farthest north Lee and his Confederate army would ever get. Unlike Lee, Ulysses S. Grant essentially worked his way up through the Union Army's military brass, with his aggressive tactics and reputation for accepting nothing less than unconditional surrender. It was in fact Grant's relentless and dogged pursuit of the rebels that eventually resulted in the capture of Richmond the capital of the Confederacy. 
The South had its own brand of dogged determination, and though it soon became apparent that they could not win the war, they were not willing to give up and lose it either. Union General William Tecumseh Sherman, serving under Grant, recognized this fact and felt the best way to end the war and limit further casualties was to cripple the South and break their spirit so completely that there was simply nothing left to fight with. This strategy became known as total war, or scorched earth, because of the necessity of burning pretty much anything that could provide food, clothing, or shelter to the enemy army. It was this strategy that Sherman employed upon chasing the rebel army down through Tennessee and into northern Georgia. These battles that were fought in and around the Atlanta area became known as the Atlanta Campaign. The Atlanta Campaign was one of the last-ditch efforts for the South to try to hold out until the next Union presidential election, hoping for a defeat of Lincoln and the election of someone more disposed to them. To that end, Confederate President Davis replaced the more timid General Johnston with the more aggressive General Hood in the hopes of holding Atlanta. However, Sherman had superior numbers and a well-supplied army, while effectively cutting off supplies to the rebel army defending Atlanta. It was inevitable that Atlanta would fall, and Sherman, in keeping with his scorched earth strategy, would give the command to destroy or burn much of it. Sherman then set his sights on Savannah and its strategic harbor by way of a destructive path through Georgia. Rebel soldiers, recognizing the futility of fighting Sherman's army, instead fled south, destroying food stores, supplies, bridges, and the like as they went to keep it from falling into Union hands. But Sherman had his own supply lines, and so what the rebels hadn't already destroyed, Sherman did. Sherman's march to the sea, as this became known as, was finally successful in breaking the back of the south, and left most of Georgia as a burned-out hull. The end of the Civil War at Appomattox Courthouse was nearly as much a result of the effective cutting off of supplies to the rebel army as it was the fighting. Chased and harried out of their capital of Richmond by the invading Union army, unable to resupply, and already half-starved and exhausted, upon finding the Union cavalry had cut off their path to the railroad south, General Lee contacted General Grant to negotiate a surrender, ending the Civil War. While the fighting ended at Appomattox Courthouse, it would be many years before the healing could well and truly begin, and so next we will turn our eyes to Reconstruction. But we will need to save that for another screencast, as that is all we have time for for now. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Here are the links to some helpful resources, as well as the sources used in the making of this screencast.